as part of all this like, initiative and sort of engagement in science. Um, but what I will say is this is a very diverse group, a very diverse room that we have here, ladies. It's a uh, group of budding scientists and a group of budding social scientists as well, right? So there's very different perspective from the work that you guys are doing and maybe where some of those, the interests lie. Um, I've got a couple backup questions, but I'm going to throw it to the floor. Does, if anyone has a question, why? yeah, go ahead, Chelsea. Um, I was just wondering how you guys like chose the topic or like specifically what you're going to do for it. Nice. Do you guys hear the question? Or? Okay, perfect. Okay. Oh, you know what? Let me start here. <laughs> so when you're when you're doing a PhD or when you're starting graduate school in general, you can get very lucky and you can find a professor that's interested in exactly what you want to do and that has funding to do that research. So in a perfect world, that would be the perfect match. Uh, but sometimes you can have an interest. For example, I have an interest in microbiology and my professor has funding to study certain types of bacteria. So if I'm interested in that, then you go on board. Um, when, you're, when you're choosing the topic, so usually you have funding for to answer one or two research questions, but then you still have to develop your own PhD. So then you have, for example, I know I have a lake. I know I have volunteers that can sample with me. I have to answer this question. So that's a non-negotiable. And then what else can I do with all of this? So that's that's the big part of your PhD. So if you're interested, interested in something specific, usually you contact professors that are studying that specific thing. If you're just more interested in a general topic, then uh, yeah, you can just make your own project out of what's already available. Ask it. Same question, you Marie. Yeah, I think I'm going to agree with what you said. Like, like, if you're lucky like, to find like your own subject and you find someone that you should pay for that, that's cool. But usually, like, someone would, would have like your own subject and you just go into it and make it kind of your own. I have a bit of a different approach because <laughs> I study a very competitive. I study in a very competitive field. Obviously, like whale whale scientists are uh, a competitive crowd because there's not a lot of whales and there's not a lot of funding. So for me, it was different. I knew what I wanted to do. I just needed to find a person to do it and be ready to move all across the, the globe for it. And that's what I, exactly what I did. I followed people and research projects, and I move all over the place. Uh, so that's something that you could also be into, <laughs> but it's uh, it's a lot more on um, a lot more engagement on your life. Go ahead, sir. Specifically for you, then, um, you said you went all across the world with professors. Where did that end up taking you? Uh, it took me to uh, so I'm European at first. I come from France, uh, so it took me to France. It took me. To Kind of all over Europe, uh, Belgium, Italy, Spain, uh, Denmark, uh, Iceland, Norway, uh, the US, Canada. Uh, and yeah, I wanted very much to go sample my own samples in Mozambique, but they were sent to me. So <laughs> I, I used to work on humpback whales as well. Uh, so it just takes me wherever, and I just go. Do you do work out? Yes, I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yes, curious, do you guys after your PhD, what type of work opportunities or what type of work you guys can do That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead, Mark. Okay, so you have different yeah, different options once you finish your PhD. Um, you can go into academia, which is like the university uh, life. So you could like Usually your goal when you go into academia would be to become a prof one day. Uh, so this is a very, this is the most competitive in my opinion field uh, because there's not a lot of professorships available anywhere. Uh, and it takes only the best of the best. So you really have to fight for it very hard. Uh, other, and usually that goes through postdocs uh, after your PhD. So you do like kind of like mini PhDs after your PhD and then you try to get uh, a professorship somewhere. Otherwise, you can go into government, which uh, are usually pretty stable positions uh, that pay pretty well, uh, but it's also pretty uh, hard to get into government. Uh, otherwise, you can try to work for an NGO if you do a lot of environment 
um, or then you can go into the industry. And those are private research, uh, and they're just different. They pay a lot more. Uh, they're easier to get in, I think. For whale, there's no private stuff, uh, <laughs> sadly, because we don't harvest whales, uh, which would be bad. But yeah, like for me, for example, I don't have that option. So I don't know about you guys. Just like the um, industry. Oh, yeah, the industry. Microbiology, environmental sciences, agriculture. Uh, it's pretty big. Um, but I, I'm going to say if you have a master's or a PhD, you can also do whatever you want. Because both a master and a PhD, it's not really about the topic that you learn, it's more about the methodology. So you're learning how to learn, you're learning how to solve problems. And I think employers really value that. They know that when you're faced with a question, when you're faced with an issue, that you will figure out how to answer it and then do it you know and and do it successfully that's when you get your diploma so yeah you you can do whatever you want you can even change fields completely uh you can start in a certain type of science and then go into another one so it's really flexible it's really flexible but only do it only do only go to grad school if you really want to because it's not it's not easy <laughs> it's not easy at all so that would be my advice I'm going to throw a question at the three of you. Um, and again, thinking about how we have a mixed group here. So you all have sort of your little specialty, your, little, your particular project that you're working on, but you're part of a much larger field. So what are some of the prevailing issues you see in the future of your field? And where do you see the need for maybe new scientists or new social science uh, scientists to help contribute to that field or to help solve those problems? I think Zineb has a really good approach there. I will no, but like with citizen science, like it's it's something that's uh, I think taking off in science. It's really interesting, and you can also do social science with citizen science. Um, kind of rolling the old. <laughs> no, no, no. I agree. I think uh, I think for yeah. I mean, I'm, I've never studied sociology, so I'm not sure what you guys are doing, but I, I do think that that's a, a good way to work together. Um, I think a lot of fields in general are going into more interdisciplinary research in general. So I think, you know, even if you study sociology and then you're interested in sciences, you, you, you can go from one field to the next. For example, I studied in both my undergrad and my master's, I was in agriculture. And I never did any microbiology or, I mean, a little bit of environmental sciences, but I was able to go from one to the next. So I'm a new microbiologist. I'm not going to be able to tell you what's going on yeah. in my field, but uh, yeah, there's always an opportunity to change it up. Yeah. If I can add in terms of the citizen science, there's a lot of people actually researching how citizen science is going on, mm -hmm. so how to approach the people that you're working with, some communities might be a bit more, maybe less wanting to get involved. So there's a lot of stuff also going on there. If you're part of a community that you know, a researcher is trying to approach, then you can maybe be like the person that is in between. So, so. Yeah. yeah, so even before choosing to do citizen science, we were looking at research, for example, that, were, that was comparing the quality of data of samples collected by scientists versus collected by just volunteers. And we were able to see that, well, there's no difference, you know, as long as you train them, a sample is a sample, so they can do it, especially if it's just a, a water sample or pro probably not a killer whale sample. But but we do, we do we have citizen do. scientists in our side, <laughs> and uh, they come with us and they help with uh, observations, so they record everything that's going on when we follow the whales, uh, the reaction to sampling, uh, how the groups interact with each other. It's very easy to train people on, yeah. and so they come in the boat and they help us. Are there any questions online, Andrew? I haven't asked we, you. We had a question online about <coughs> red tide and whether or not that's a similar phenomenon. So yeah. so. I, I focus on algal blooms. So first, algal blooms, the, when a lake is green, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's cyanobacteria. And then it could be other types of algae or like 
eukaryotes, unicellular eukaryotes, such as Euglena. And then for a reptile, it can also be cyanobacteria. Usually it's more in the ocean. And it's mainly, so cyanobacteria have different pigments, giving them their color. So it can be green, it can be more blue, could be brown, could be red. But the main one that I'm studying is mostly the, the green looking algal blooms because they're the, the important ones or the most prevalent ones here in our lakes in Quebec. Any other questions from the floor, guys? Don't be shy, we're just talking. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, you said you traveled a lot, but was that also part of the budget of your research or was that like you had to pay for all the trips? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, both. So it started, um, I think my first, uh, the first country I did for research just as a volunteer was to go to Italy, uh, which is close to France, by the way. It's not, it's not that far when you're in Europe. Um, but it was like everybody, everybody was having a cool summer and I just like worked all summer for free as a volunteer. Uh, it was really cool because I was with whales and dolphins, but it was still like unpaid labor. And so I did a lot of those. Uh, so I would save money all year to basically just go work for free in the summer. But that's how I gained the skills and that's how I gained uh, the contacts. And then I was able to get positions. So in my master's and then in my PhD. And then once you're in a lab that has a lot of funding, then uh, you can get paid to, well, you don't get paid more, but your travel is reimbursed. <laughs> so then I went to like Japan and a bunch of like different areas to present at conferences. Uh, I'm going to Dublin in 10 days to present my results at another international conference. So you do a lot of this and then it's a lot of like trying to find money as uh, a student. There are a lot of programs that offer uh, internship money or that help you pay for your traveling if you're going to volunteer somewhere. So it's a lot of looking and Googling uh, every possible opportunity and applying to everything you can. <laughs> and then something's gonna happen and then you can transfer those skills to something else in the future. Once you have the skills, you can just use them for grad school or for a job or something else. So it's a lot of sacrifices at first, but then it pays off. <laughs> Um, a lot of these students are over the next few years going to get their first research opportunities, get in front of their first poster presentation or first oral presentation. Would you? I, I'm not going to put any one person on the spot, but if any of the three of you, or all three of you, can share what it was like the first time you had to stand up and present something that you had ownership mm -hmm. of, that you had done. But knowing that there's others in the audience that may have knowledge there, how was that for you? It's <laughs> <laughs> terrifying the first time, of course. Like, especially if you go to a conference, you present to your peers. Oh my goodness. I think my first big conference was in Japan. And I was just like presenting some of my work in Iceland. So like, really not the same place at all and it was like a room filled with like maybe a hundred people that were all very very much smarter than me and I had to present my results and I was like honestly I think I like had a minor panic attack before it and like now it's easier because I've done it many times <coughs> over the years but the first time it's always terrifying so if you're terrified of presenting your group project uh it gets better <laughs> but it is scary at first so I actually want to ask a follow-up because of the way you answered that, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Now that you've also been one of the people in the seats listening to others do their first presentation, do you still feel like that room of a hundred were all smarter than you? <laughs> oh, everybody has some contribution. And like everybody is smarter than me in some place. Like, uh, but yeah. you're also, I mean, you have your knowledge in this area that exceeds all of anything else. Absolutely, but that is enough. I don't know anything about her project. <laughs> like she's way smarter than me on anything cyanobacteria. So it's uh yeah. Um yeah. Uh, just to to add to that, no one's out to get you. No one's there to judge you. You're just there to present your research. People are listening to you. 
some people will be interested, some people won't be interested. That's just the way it is. But don't think too much about yourself. Think about, okay, this is an opportunity for me to share something that I know. And it might spark interest in someone else. It might not. Uh, if you're going to a conference, if, if you're a new student, professors will know more than you because they've been learning for like decades. Yeah. And that's normal. You're not supposed to know more than them. Of course, they expect you to know enough for that stage in your career, academic career. But yeah, no one's out there to judge you. You'll get used to it. It's terrifying at first. But as time goes by, honestly, it's just like another routine thing that you have to do. <laughs> If we're going to add anything, usually the smartest, most incredible profs are the most humble and approachable people. So I've had like interactions with people that were like gods in my field, and I saw them and was like, oh, hi. And like they were just like the sweetest people. So it's like once you rip out the band aid, it's good. I'm going to ask this one to you, Noreen. Um, did you know this was what you always wanted to do? Like, you just like know at this age at 17, these are the courses I'm going to take, this is where I'm going to go, this is where I'm going to go to my university, or was it more of a windy road? I, get, I, I always knew I wanted to do something about ecology because it was the thing that was interesting me. But like, I wasn't sure like I was doing like marine biology or like on fish or genomics, and I didn't know that I wanted to do my field. Like it was more like opportunity that came. Like in uh, when I was doing like my undergraduate friends, I used to like terrestrial um, species, and I have like a lot of opportunities to go to marine field trip and everything. And so I chose that. Oh, okay, it's good. So I start to like gaining experience in that, and every time it was just like opportunities, and I just go into it and here I am. <laughs> I'll throw the same question to you, um, you know, was it, uh, was it any experience in particular that's maybe you were on a trajectory and then just changed the direction? You sort of implied that now you find yourself in microbiology, it's not what you wanted to do, or doing agriculture. So what got you on this new path? So I, I heard you uh, earlier in the hallway when you guys were talking about med school and everyone wants to go to med school. I wanted to go to med school as well. And then I remember when I was in uh, undergrad, um, I had to take an elective and everyone was saying that, okay, this elective is quite easy and go do it. And it was a, a soil science class. And I loved it so much. And that changed all my plans. I was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to deal with humans or be a doctor anymore. I, I want to see what's in the soil. And he sold it so well. It was like, the soil is full of microorganisms and we only know a fraction of them. And it was just so interesting. Um, it was a, it's an exciting new field. So I think it has to do with what you're exposed to, um, the professor. I think it, you know, a passionate professor can make the whole difference. You can be so sure that this is what you want to study and then you, you have an amazing professor and that can change your trajectory completely. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's how I got into the, the field initially. And then from switching from agriculture to microbiology, so I did take a break between my master's and my PhD. I worked for a little bit, and we were uh, organizing a symposium on um, microbial, well, soil biodiversity. And just reading the content, I was like, I think I want to work with microbes now. You know, I've, I've done the plants, I've done the soil. Now I want to, I want to deal with the microbes. So that's how I switched to microbiology. Was the whale necklace always like has that been there since you were five years old? Or I yeah, you guessed it. Yeah, always killer whales, always. And like it's gonna sound so freaking cliche, but I was five. I was gonna be like, I'm gonna save the killer whales. And I, I come from the Alps, by the way, so there's no ocean by me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, everybody in my school was like this crazy girl. She's all about whales. She's creepy. But I was just like, that's just what I'm going to do. And every, I think every decision I've ever made was just with that goal in mind. And it keeps being the case. And it's going to keep being the case for a long time until I get tired of it. Which I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. Are we going to have time? It's true. When, when did you want to end? Okay.
around two o'clock. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ethan. Ethan's got a question. I guess for at least So um, we have sort of a history of scientists, science and activists not necessarily mixing very well in terms of its ability to persuade that scientific fact and the ability of, of the scientists to persuade people against their own interests to act on those facts are not necessarily, they don't necessarily go very well together. Are you interested in going outside as a science towards the political arena to try to persuade people that what you're doing should be acted upon? Or are you sort of more interested in just sticking to the, here's the research, do what you want from this side? So I asked myself the same question about four years ago when I started my PhD. I was like, because I want to go into academia, and I just said that was the most competitive field, in my opinion, at least in my field. And I was like, okay, well, doing a PhD is not enough. What, what else do I do next to my PhD so I stand out the most? And I was like, I can choose activism, I could choose science communication, I could choose uh, any like citizen science. And I chose science communication. And so I've uh, been communicating with the public for about three and a half years now, uh, trying to engage people on these stories and try to share with them the importance of whale research. But I did not go into the political side because of what you said, because there is such, I think, uh, a separation that's currently going on between science and uh, po politics. And I didn't feel like I was legitimate to, like, I didn't feel like I had enough baggage to, like, get into the politics of it. And I still don't think I do. Uh, I don't think my skills are there just yet. Uh, so we will see in the future. But for now, I think engaging with the public and trying to share uh, our love and knowledge for whales is, uh, is good enough for now. But maybe in the future. Thanks. Okay. So maybe I'll end with one last question. So a lot of what you're doing here is community outreach. Um, why is that important to you? Why get involved in community outreach and, and, and talking to people here about what it is you do? Uh, why is that important to you? Maybe I, maybe I, maybe I asked the wrong question. Uh, I think, well, we're all, I think, funded by public research uh my main motivation is i'm gonna give back to the public what the public gave me the public gave me funds to do my research i think the least i can do is try to share what i found in an accessible way i think that the public who leads everybody leads their own lives they don't have to be scientists to understand my uh my research i think that's my uh my motivation and i really want to share it with them what they give me back and I think inspire uh, people like you guys uh, who maybe want to become scientists and like show you that um, we're all, I think, pretty regular people and we are all scientists. And and maybe if you want to do science, then we've inspired you maybe to try it. Uh, and science is cool. And yeah. Anything to add? I think that was pretty good. <laughs> 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 <laughs>